I didn't know it was a cult until I'd been free for years. As has happened so many times in my life, the realization didn't even strike me until the words left my mouth. So you grew up, what, Baptist? Uh, no, we were, it was um, a cult. I grew up in a cult. <laughs> Drop the words, I grew up in a cult, in polite conversation, and you suddenly have the room's attention. As cults go, we were pretty PG. No ritual sacrifices, except for that book burning. No magical elixirs, except for those bitter-tasting mixtures our faith was never quite strong enough to render curative, and we were never quite charismatic enough to sell. No sacred sneakers. Definitely no sacred sneakers. <laughs> but if I had the childhood hours back that I spent scouring second-hand stores for modest clothing, I'd have myself a few weeks for contemplation. We weren't quite Amish. We had electricity and cars, after all. We weren't quite Mennonite. We women didn't wear head coverings or make our own ankle-length dresses. We weren't even any longer Grace Brethren. There was some sort of theological falling out between my grandmother and the church elders that I was never devout enough to understand. We were a uniquely patriarchal cult accidentally created by my highly educated but deeply paranoid grandmother. Life was rough for my grandmother and her reaction to hardship was to cling even more tightly to the structure and sense of control that puritanical beliefs provided her. I was utterly sheltered from the world that had hurt me, a world that no longer existed. I was paddled over pre-algebra once. I was obstinate and my mother was frustrated and neither of us knew what she was doing, but I was never physically abused. I was taught that the Protestant Christian Bible, both Old Testament and New, was the literal and exact word of an angry God, and that it was my responsibility to learn and obey it so that I wouldn't go to hell. But I was loved. The only thing I feared as a child, aside from embarrassment and the deep end of the pool, was the rapture. <laughs> Didn't grow up in a cult? Not familiar with the rapture? Well, are you in for a treat? <laughs> In my cult's teachings, based almost entirely on the book of Revelation and my grandmother's depression, when God, <laughs> when God has finally had enough of this wicked world and all end times prophecies have been fulfilled, think earthquakes, particularly nasty wars and new and exciting plagues, God will scoop all of the real Christians up into heaven, leaving all non-believers and fake Christians to complete and utter apocalypse. When you rarely leave the Indiana farmhouse in which you've been raised, and your only news sources are Rush Limbaugh and your cult leader grandmother, it's easy to believe that you're living in the end times, that you're really a fake Christian, and that you're going to wake up one day completely alone in the world because everyone you love has been whisked away to heaven. And here you are, at seven, about to face apocalypse alone. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and every slave, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? These were my bedtime stories, and I absolutely <laughs> believed they were going to happen to me. Even in my perfectly Beth-sized twin bed, with crickets singing huskily on still warm Midwestern summer nights, with a cool breeze fluttering the curtains and a myriad of stars just beginning to prickle the sky, even amongst that perfection, I was afraid of utterly imagined horrors. Horrors that were my penalty for simply being born. A dozen years later, I was free. The cult began to crumble when my grandmother died. We were a patriarchal faith in theory only, as my grandmother was the one constant amongst a sea of well-meaning but uninspiring part-time preachers. When she passed, we stopped meeting every Sunday. We no longer gathered for Bible studies. Our songs were silenced. Our guide was gone. It was that same year that dial-up internet crash-landed in my particular Indiana cornfield. 
If grandma had been alive to witness this technological marvel, she would undoubtedly have found an end times prophecy to fit and admonished our parents to keep a close eye on our usage lest the devil tempt us away from the faith with ones and zeros and shine. But she wasn't. I was 14. At 19, those ones and zeros and that shine led me to the book that freed me. Those five intervening years were the saddest I have ever been. Every goddamn day was a battle between what made me happy, reason, rock and roll, irreverence, and who my cult had taught me I was supposed to be. I was supposed to want a husband and babies. I was supposed to enjoy handicrafts and couponing. I was supposed to be serious and matronly. I was supposed to be ashamed. To be taught that your gender is worth less by members of that very gender is a special sort of fucked. But at 19, I reached my breaking point and decided that if my faith was the one true faith, it could easily withstand open-minded research into other faiths. Not believing in any God at all never once occurred to me. Suicide did. It was always in a sort of detached and exasperated way that I'd consider self-harm. I'd invariably committed some dreadful sin, listening to rock and roll, crushing on a boy, daring to disagree with an elder that didn't feel wrong, but that I knew I needed to crawl back to my angry God and seek forgiveness for, and I'd think, I'm not happy here. Nothing sanctified makes me as happy as sin makes me, so why not speed up the heaven process? Why not take myself to the place that is promised perfection so that I can stop disappointing God with my terrible wickedness? But because the theology of heaven after suicide was a bit murky for me, I never followed through. So at 19, and amongst a slew of related library books, I borrowed the book your church doesn't want you to read. <laughs> Assuming that it was a treatise on the dangers of institutionalized religion and a guide to Judeo-Christian church at home. I was so very, very wrong. The fifth essay in the book's mishmashed collection of works, a mere two pages long and written by Thomas Jefferson, is entitled Reason and Religion. It set me free. Do not be frightened from this inquiry by any fear of its consequences. You must lay aside all prejudice on both sides and neither believe nor reject anything because any other persons or descriptions of persons have rejected or believed it. Your own reason is the only oracle given you by heaven. Me, myself, my own mind. I was enough. No parent, no preacher, no collection of fantastical and quite frequently murdery stories could tell me how best to live. It was up to me. I was terrified, completely convinced that I would be disowned by my family and friend. Yes singular friend. <laughs> so I just didn't tell them. I went on about my life. I worked. I kept to myself. I read. But I've always had an honesty problem, and when my mom finally asked why I was poring over the book your church doesn't want you to read instead of the Bible, <laughs> and why Freedom from Religion Foundation literature was arriving in the mail, I told her. I told her that I'd long questioned why what I felt to be right contradicted what I'd been taught to believe was right. I told her that I'd grown tired of waiting for God to tell me what my next step in life should be. I told her about the book. I told her about Thomas Jefferson. I told her I was agnostic. My mom quietly received this bombshell, then matter-of-factly bustled off to work. A few days later, she too, just as matter-of-factly, left the faith. Lest you think this is some sort of victory, to this day, my mom firmly believes that the Earth is 6,000 years old, that vaccines cause autism, and that cancer is a government conspiracy. <laughs> she is a bit of a follower, and she worships the ground upon which I walk. This wasn't a win. This was a draw. I wasn't disowned. I wasn't shunned. 
I was thoughtfully heard out by everyone in my family and by a select group of leaders in the church I'd been attending. No one could answer my questions. No one had words from God for me. No one tried to stop me when I left. I've been traveling in and out of grief over the person I could have been ever since. At first, I was profoundly angry, angry that my family had kept me so completely isolated for so long, teaching me lies and feeding me fear. Angry that I'd been waiting around for a husband I didn't need and babies I didn't want when I could have been going to school or learning a trade or joining the Peace Corps or very nearly anything else. I was angry over years lost. Then I tried to dismiss it, to just get over it. I routinely worked three jobs. I made myself a student of human nature. I attended a strip mall college. And I started making actual friends to whom I was not also biologically related. <laughs> then I was depressed again for a bit. The friends I thought I'd made weren't good people, not evil, but takers and users. The jobs I found after graduation were unfulfilling, and I constantly felt that I'd never be able to catch up at life, that I'd already missed too much. But then I revisited Jefferson. I tried my damnedest not to live my life by anyone else's imagined standards. I quit the jobs that depressed me, ghosted the friends who only wanted to use me, poured my heart and soul into the bookstore that I loved, and started playing Friday night board games with weird and wonderful people. <laughs> I understand now that it was misguided love and a liberal helping of fear that built our cult, and that despite all I lacked, I was loved. I made no mistakes from which I did not also learn. My mom is still an important and frustrating and desperately loving part of my life. Gods are not. I'll never be totally free of that leash. Inferiority and guilt are difficult to unlearn. But as Ingersoll notes in the final pages of the book my cult didn't want me to read, I want no heaven for which I must give my reason, no happiness in exchange for my liberty, and no immortality that demands the surrender of my individuality. It's our first time on the last stage that came.